Yeah, great. So good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm going basically switch uh, our attention back to the issue of financial frictions and macroeconomics, uh, basically the place where we started. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about the banking, liquidity and bank runs in an infinite horizon economy, paper written by Gert Lehrer and Kiyoraki and published in, Ameri in American Economic Review in 2015. So yeah, let's, let's get started. Uh, basically, uh, literature has two complementary approaches to capture the link between the financial distress and the real economy. One of them uh, emphasizes how the erosion of the bank capital during economic recession or general downturn uh, hinders a bank's ability to intermedi intermediate funds, uh, therefore leading to depressed asset prices, and finally, slower economic growth, which is basically the standard financial accelerator uh, mechanism that we that was pioneered by Gitler and by Ber Bernanke and Gelter, who seen it last uh, semester. And the second approach is based on the very classic paper by Diamond and Divik, which uh, focuses on how liquidity mismatch uh, uh, on the bank's balance sheet opens up the possibility of the bank run uh, and generally to the losses in the economy. Uh, well, it seems like during the uh, Great Recession uh, in 2008, both mechanisms were in place. Uh, here we can see how uh, rapid was the erosion of the bank capital during the years of 2007 and 2008 on the one, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there are also a lot of, a lot of suggestions that during the years prior to the Great Recession, the bank's reliability on the short-term uh, funding, especially in the form of the repo contracts, just skyrocketed, as we can see here. And in fact, the repo market was exactly the, the part of the financial system uh, which experienced the most of the runs during the uh, most recent global financial crisis. So uh, to the date when the paper was written, uh, the problem was that there were a lack of macroeconomic models that will be uh, that were able to adequately capture both mechanisms. I mean, financial accelerator mechanism and the bank run mech, uh, mechanisms. And moreover, uh, a few of these models, if they were, were suitable for quantitative analysis. Uh, moreover, even DSG models to date uh, with financial frictions embedded in them were in most cases unable to forecast the downturn of the magnitude of the Great Recession, which also motivates the necessity of the, some mechanism, mechanism of the sudden stop, which in the present context just means the bank run, and basically the, uh, the freezing of the financial system. So the goal of this paper is to develop a quite simple and tractable macroeconomic model uh, with banking instability embedded in it that will feature both financial accelerator effects and the bank runs. Generally, the mechanism of the model is as follows. Uh, some macroeconomic fundamentals are going to affect the possibility of runs uh, and uh, therefore will lead to the possibility of the banking run equilibrium, which will translate into macroeconomy further. There are two main variables that are gonna uh, influence the possibility of the banking run equilibrium. One of them is the uh, balance sheet conditions, basically the leverage of the banking system. And the second one is the level of the asset liquidation price, which is gonna be endogenous. So let's bring that, that, one. Can I yes. ask you some question of the motivation just to clarify something? So, yes. what they are trying to capture here, right? If you see, I mean, in 2008, a financial ETF, you are going to see the bid drop. And at the same time, like some credit spread measure or some spread measure of return going up, like a scissor. So, yes. what they are trying to capture here is that economic phenomenon, right? Yeah, they're trying to capture how, uh, the, if, how this mechanism of financial accelerator combines with the 
possibility of the banking run equilibrium. So what we're gonna see further is that uh, the crisis uh, gonna have two phases. One phase is gonna be some kind of a slow crisis, which means just the uh, relatively slow deterioration of microeconomic fundamentals that finally give uh, rise for banking run equilibrium. And finally, this initial downturn gonna end up with the sudden drop. Uh, effectively the bank run equilibrium which gonna give us like very huge uh, economic recession and uh, call up basically collapse of the financial system that's the mechanism they're trying to capture how these make how these two mechanisms coincide with each other and complement each other as yeah as it seems that these are i mean conceptually two different things one is the magnitude of the a drop. You can see, well, let's just be concrete. The size of the drop in GDP uh, or investment during the Great Recession is much larger, a few times larger than, let's say, the TFP shock. Yeah. Uh, that's one. You can say, well, that's an interesting phenomenon we try to explain. In other words, what you mentioned is the duration, how long a recession yeah. will last. But I'm not sure that uh, the second one is really that systematic. Of course, the Greater Recession exhibits both, but if you go back to some other kind of uh, recessions, the, the duration is not necessarily much longer if the drop, initial drop is bigger than the TFP shock. You yeah. can also have a very quick recovery, for example. Yeah, here, uh, in particular here, as like we're gonna see the recovery depends on basically on how fast the banking system gonna be recapitalized after the initial shock or the bank run. So therefore, like the, indeed the length of the recession may be longer than like in other conventional models. Yeah, so, you can, I, you know, you can easily think about a theory that it can drop a really large drop, but then it won't necessarily generate a very long recession. You know, just, mm -hmm. I just think about the people, that diseases that make people sick, they deteriorate really fast, but it may also be possible that they recover so fast. So you don't have a very long, you have a very, very severe, you know, um, illness, but then you don't have a very long one. So uh, it seems that they're mo mostly motivated by the first one, by the size of the drop of the greater recession, not necessarily by the duration, the length of the uh, recession. Uh, also. Yeah, yeah, okay. I agree more. Oh, I see. Just one more quick question. There yeah. in the last, in that slide, in bullets one and two, you said condition of the balance sheets leverage. The leverage here, because you are thinking like pre-2008, is endogenous. It's not like exogenous leverage. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It's going to be endogenous. Yeah, it's going to be the key variable that's going to affect the probability of the, of the, of the, Bank chronic equilibrium, as well as the. But I, I will right, get. Right. I will get to it. So this this brings us to the model. So let me talk about the uh, math and the model and stuff. So first of all, the model is gonna be of the infinite time horizon. There are gonna be two classes of agents: households and bankers. Each of each of which is gonna be a continuum of unit measure. Bankers are going to be specialists in intermediating financial funds between households and productive assets. While households, uh, they will have an opportunity to, uh, to have the deposits in the banking system, but they also can make these loans to the production side directly, but they're going to be less efficient in a way that we will see shortly. Uh, there are going to be two goods, non-durable good, basically the consumption good, and the durable asset, which we will refer as capital. Capital is assumed to be with zero depreciation and in fixed total supply, such that the total amount of capital is going to be divided each time between the capital hold by bankers, KB, 
and the capital hold by the households, KH. Here's the uh, quick illustration of the structure of the model. So as I said, we're gonna have households. They will either deposit, uh, they will save either in form of the deposits in the banks or in the form of direct uh, loans to the production side of the economy, which is a little bit degenerate. So it's more correct to refer to this side as pro just productive assets rather than some business or projects. And bankers gonna be intermediate funds and also uh, invest into uh, uh, these productive assets. Uh, here's the intermediation technology. So each, at each period of time, a date T, the banker who intermediates KB amount of capital are uh, gonna have the following return in the period afterwards. So the one unit of the uh, capital gonna yield ZT plus one KTB units of output or the consumption good, as well as left over the capital itself. So here ZT plus one gonna be the productivity shock, which is gonna follow just simple AR1 process. Uh, on the other hand, households basically have the same technology when they lend funds to productive assets directly or hold capital directly, but they're less efficient in the sense that uh, in order to uh, invest into productive capital, they're gonna pay the management cost F of KTIH, which is assumed to be uh, some simple con convex quadratic function. So the role of the management cost is exactly to capture this lack of competence of uh, the households in terms of monitoring, um, lending and screening lending, etc. So here's the place. Basically, therefore, households uh, in that sense are less efficient in lending to uh, in holding capital in comparison to bankers. We will see what for what it gives rise after for further. Uh, the deposit contract is going to be specified as follows: RT plus one going to be the gross return on deposits, and uh, it will depend on whether the bank equilibrium occurs, bank run equilibrium occurs or not. In case of the no bank run, uh, households going to be paid with R bar gross return or promised return by banks. Uh, and in case of the bank run equilibrium, they are gonna be paid only with the sum share of that promised return, XT plus one. We can think of the XT plus one as the total liquidation value of bank assets in case of the bank run per unit of promised deposit obligations. And it's assumed to be between zero and one. So further we will also referred to XT plus one as the recovery rate. Here's the, yes. Just, well, the, in the motivation part, uh, the, the authors are using uh, Diamond Divivik. But this model is the reason for banking is very different from Diamond Divivik. Yes. The banks yes, yeah. actually have uh, some technological advantage. It doesn't have the cost, for example, the F. Yes, in, indeed. Uh, and the actually authors, they, they're mentioning in the paper that the way how they're modeling the banking sector and the bank runs is not as close to the diamond Dibuk model, even though they used it in the motivation part. Uh, I believe that uh, this uh, setup of the banking system at the bank run equilibrium is closer to the uh, some of um, some of the papers by Timothy Kehoe from Minnesota and uh, and other guy. I forget. I, uh, it's it's closer to the model of the sudden uh, uh, sudden uh, debt default. I believe I uh, I forget the exact paper. That's okay. Much it's just try just is it important to know that actually the yes. mechanism for bank runs is quite different. Yeah, and the, yes, uh, ex uh, sorry, uh, the, yes. The reason for You're banking right. itself, not just for bank run, the reason for banking is just the banks are better at managing those uh, investments here. 
where yes, in diamond divvik banks are just an uh, intermediary to uh, you know basically uh, uh, utilize the law for larger numbers yeah you're absolutely right i didn't mention but yeah thanks for the comment uh so okay uh, go ahead yeah Vlad, one, so, one simple yeah. question, sorry. In the graph yes. you, 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 you showed us, um, what was, what, where is the friction there? Oh, I will get to the financial friction a little bit later when I will talk about the bankings. There are gonna be oh, financial okay. friction, of course. Uh, yeah, just be yeah, patient. <laughs> well, uh, the problem, the household's problem is quite standard. So they're gonna be maximizing their utility, where the instantaneous utility going to be assumed as logarithmic, subject to the budget constraint. Budget constraint shows that uh, the income, the total income of the household comes, first of all, from the endowment of non-durable or consumption goods, which is varies proportionally with the productivity shock. Others saying that uh, it helps uh, capture the, the business cycles fluctuations more just better uh second term is just the return basically it's all this uh two terms is the return on the savings from the previous period one of which is the return on deposits and the second is the gross return on the capital stock held in the previous period uh, and this income gonna be spent on uh, consumption uh Dep new deposits if they decide to roll over it. Uh, the acquisition of the new capital with price QT and the management costs of, of holding the capital. So nothing too serious here. So just if uh, if F is zero for K, would the Q be equal to one? Uh, would be what? Equal the Q, to the price of capital. Uh, if f is zero if f uh, is zero uh, let me think uh, because you can you can trans think, you can transform you know goods to capital almost immediately yes yeah i think so indeed yeah so the q the tobin's q here is again it's just another because the tobin's q is different from one because of this cost the household has to go through well if you do direct investment uh, from going through the bank it goes through the friction that they are going to tell us later i guess yes either way yeah. it's costly yeah like this friction will basically give rise for the uh, some constraint on the on, on the bank's portfolio on the bank's possibility for leverage yeah, we're, we're going, you're and, going to tell us yeah i'm going to tell about it yeah uh, so here are the first of the conditions for the household's problem yes the first condition is for deposits just standard oil recreation or capital lambda is the stochastic discount factor very standard the second one is the uh, first of the condition uh for uh for capital holdings which is also where our our cap h uh, defined as follows it is the gross marginal return on capital and as we see uh here yeah the managerial costs they uh they aff affects uh the return in uh, in, in negative uh, way uh the key Thing that I have to mention here is that these derivations are made under the assumption that household assigns zero probability to a bank run, uh, which we will refer as the baseline model. So here, uh, bank runs in this particular particular setup gonna be completely unanticipated. So ex ante, households uh, think of the return on their deposits as the riskless uh, interest rate, basically. Uh, what and, is uh, what is the what is the alpha? Uh, alpha is the parameter of the uh, managerial cost function. Here it is. Basically, it governs the convexity of okay. the uh, of the of the cost function. So we, okay. we will assume this function form throughout the paper. So let's uh, let's get a closer look at banking sector because it's 
really the very unique feature of this model that I believe we haven't seen something like this uh, throughout our courses here in Penn State. So let's get deep into it. Uh, first thing to mention is that here, the banking system gonna be completely unregulated. In that respect, uh, it's gonna uh, mimic the shadow banking more rather than the standard commercial uh, banking with deposit insurance. So let's think about the banks here as the shadow banks or the investment banks, which were in the epicenter actually during the uh, global financial crisis. Each banker uh, will manage uh, financial intermediary and funds, capital investments by issuing deposits uh, and by other issuing deposits or by using her own equity or the net worth. Financial friction that I'm going to talk about shortly will uh, constrain the bankers and their ability to raise deposits and therefore it's gonna constrain the uh, amount of credit that uh, banking sector can generate. Uh, every period, uh, each banker will survive with probability sigma such that the expected lifetime of each bank are going to be fixed and equal to one over one uh, minus uh, sigma. Every period, the new banker that enter uh, the financial system going to be endowed with WB units of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the good, of the consumption good. And this endowment going to be received only in the first period of time. The total number of bankers going to be fixed such that the number of entering bankers is gonna be equal to the number of exiting bankers each period. Banks are assumed risk neutral and they are enjoy utility from consumption of the, the, of the non-durable good upon the period when they exit. So here it is the, uh, the expected utility of the continuing banker at the end of the period T which we refer as VT or a franchise value of the banker, which is gonna be like this, just, just the expected sum of all future uh, consumptions uh, weighted by the probability of the exit at date T plus E, yeah. So this term is just the probability of the exiting at date T plus E, and we multiply it with the consumption and that flow over the infinite horizon gives uh, uh, the, bank, the banker's franchise value. Net worth of the surviving banker uh, will develop according to this equation, which I named MW constraint or M net worth constraint. So it's gonna uh, represent the gross return on the capital held in previous period net of the deposit costs. For the new banker at time T, uh, the net worth is just its in, uh, her endowment and for existing banker, the consumption, this term gonna be financed exactly by the left net worth from the uh, last period. And when banker decides on the amount of uh, capital investments, uh, the balance sheet condition should be satisfied here. So the total assets of the of each banker should be equal to its obligations. Obligations, okay. deposit obligations uh, plus net, net worth. Yep. Uh, just one question. So this is something we didn't cover in the course. I'm not sure it will be covered at all, but in previous years, it was covered by, uh, by Professor Zhou. The underlying assumption here is literally the same as in many of the papers we did on financial macro, which the contract is, is short-term contract, one period contract repeating. There's no dynamic contract, but here there is a room for dynamic contracting. You, this, these bankers have some incentive problems, so it's worthwhile to use the bank's past history to discipline the contract terms in the future. Here, that's not allowed. Mm. So yeah. that, that literature is big, and uh, I would suggest any one of you interested in financial macro to actually read that literature on dynamic contracting. Yes, thank you. Yep. So Vlad, one question. Here, the one key assumption for this to work is that 
that mark-to-market um, uh, -market, uh, net worth constraint um, ca can be negative? Yes, actually, uh, yeah, one of the implications of, the, of, the, of how the banking sector here is set up is that uh, bankers cannot operate with negative net worth. It will violate the incentive constraint condition that I'm going to talk about shortly when I will switch to financial friction topic. But uh, yeah, net worth cannot be uh, neg negative. If it's negative, it means bankruptcy, basically. Bankers okay. cannot operate yeah, with, with, with negative net worth. Yeah. So here's the financial friction uh, that we're going to introduce. So uh, during the period T, so inside that period T, but right after uh, the decision on how much to uh, capital to accumulate and how much deposits uh, to have, each banker going to decide whether to operate honestly or to divert its or her assets. So operating honestly means just holding assets until the next period, enjoy realized payoffs and meet deposit obligations. There is nothing special. Diverting assets means to sell fraction theta of assets, uh, of acquired assets secretly for personal use. So the fraction theta is between zero and one. This means that the bankers cannot sell their assets, the, the big amount of assets just instantly. They only can sell only the some share of the assets. So these um, sellings cannot be too fast in some sense. So therefore, theta is just the share it's between zero and one. And of course, if we uh, want households actually demand uh, deposits, the incentive compatibility should be, uh, should be, uh, should be in place because otherwise uh, there will be no reason for rational households to actually to have assets on their balance sheet. So the incentive, const incentive compatibility constraint should imply that the gain from diverting assets, which is equ equals exa exactly the share of uh, the amount of the assets sold secretly, here it is, should be at least no bigger than the present value of, the of, of operating honestly which is represented by the franchise value VT, which I talked about just a couple of slides ago. So here's the incentive compatibility constraint on the, on the contract between households and uh, bankers. Here's the timing of uh, okay, the event. Just before you describe bank banking, so if we try to think about banks or bankers in this model, they are literally captured by two parameters, theta and alpha. If alpha is zero, bank would have no role here because the household would mm -hmm. directly invest. Yes. If theta is one, also there's no place for the bank because every time we put the money in the bank, they just you know divert the funds away, right? So these two yes. parameters it literally captures the role of the bank. So for the banks to have any role in the equilibrium here, alpha has to be less than one, theta has to be sufficient in less than one. Yes. Well, the, the, on the other hand, if theta is zero, there's there's no financial friction, yeah. yeah so yeah, if the theta is zero, there's no incentive problem. This I see constraint never binds actually. Yeah, and it, so, it just means the frictionless financial market. Right. So all the investment would go through the banks rather than you know, some of them going through the bank, some of them going through direct investment. So Yeah, but the financial system gonna question. gonna be Yes, sorry. I ask this question because in the end, it would be um, interesting to check against those uh, extreme values of these two parameters. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, as you said, in the, in the cases that you just described, the financial system is going to be just, there will be no role of the financial system. It's going to be perfectly frictionless and will not affect the real economy, basically. Right, okay. Yeah, so, yeah thanks for pointing out. Uh, and here's the timing, uh, just to keep tra track of what is happening. So after the Z-shock is realized, 
bank is going to retain its net net worth, issue debt. Then will, they will decide how, basically at the same time, decide how uh, uh, much assets, uh, how much capital they would held. After that, we will, they will decide, they are deciding whether to continue with operating honestly or to divert. Diverting banks basically means bankruptcy and bankruptcy, the possibility of the bankruptcy is the exactly the cost of uh, diverting funds. Uh, and nothing happens then. If they decide to continue, then in period T plus one, new short is realized and the economy goes uh, further. Uh, so here's the banker's problem. We can restate it in recursive way, keeping in mind that uh, if uh, the banker exits with probability one minus sigma, its consumption consumption is going to equal just the net worth. And the maximization is uh, with respect to deposits and capital of stock, subject to these three constraints, the net worth constraint, balance sheet constraint, and incentive compatibility constraint. The beauty of this problem what, is that... What does the subscript T on V represent or capture? Uh, yeah, it is the, as I said, it's uh, the banker's uh, franchise value at the end of period T. Right, but I mean, that must be a shorthand notation for the dependence of V on some state variables. So my question is, what are the state variables um, here? I mean, the T is really a shorthand notation. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, Z, the, the ZT, first of all. Yeah, okay, the ZT, uh, yes, the NT. The... The NT, uh, the NT is yeah. the individual, the bank's the individual state of variable. What else? Yeah, they, uh, 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 let's think. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, because, yeah, I think, uh, yeah that's, I think that that's basically that, that should be it. No, what about KT? KT, uh, uh, KT is actually, they're going to decide on the, KTB in, uh, in oh, KT minus, okay, KT minus then one. K, then or, KT minus, yes, then KT minus one should be the state variable. Yeah, I ask this because, you, I mean, I did know this paper, eventually they're going to do guess and verify, right? To find the solutions, but the guess verify, you really have to take it very explicitly what the V depends on. Not, you can't just say, well, V is a function of T. V is a function mm -hmm. of the state variable at T. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Well. So the beauty of this uh, problem, uh, mathematically, I mean, it, it, it is that it is constant return to scale, and uh, I mean, both all the constraint, both the constraints and the objective function, and I can reformulate it uh, uh, in a little bit different way. So from and W constraint, we can divide both sides by NT and uh, obtain such an expression where RBT plus one is the realized return on banks assets. Yeah, I think also like quite straightforward what it means. And the phi T is defined as leverage multiple or just the ratio of the bank assets to uh, its net worth. And it's uh, going to be actually a very crucial variable afterwards. So, Vlad, one question yep. of that restriction that is not uh, very clear to me. So, the, the first term of how much the, the percentage change in, in your net worth, the first term is captured by how much you make with the spreads time the leverage. Yes. And where that extra RT plus one comes, you are assuming that you are putting the yeah, it's just uh, it's just from this we divide both sides by uh, net worth of the previous periods and uh, like after some rearrangements. Uh, oh, so the so here. you make with your assets um, the the you get the, the spread of the interest rates and the the pure um, the pure um, net worth you put it in some uh, fixed rate. I mean. I mean, intuitively, that extra term, I'm not getting much. Um, 
but but anyways um yeah 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 you know, uh, like the, the key thing in this equation is just to see that the growth rate of the net worth is the is increasing function of the leverage multiple as far as the uh, the spread is positive. That's the, the key thing to understand from this equation. Okay, actually. thanks. Thanks. Yeah, but uh, mathematically, it's nothing. Uh, you know, nothing serious. You just took. This expression divided by n of the previous period, and after some rearrangements that are quite uh, not quite you know in some big deal, then you obtain this expression. Really, nothing you can do it by just pencil and paper <laughs> with uh, within a minute. So yeah. Uh, uh, also, let's define the as uh, authors refer as the Tobin skew. Uh, the uh, uh, relation of the VT to net worth as psi t. Uh, so the Banker's problem is going to be reformulated such that where constra this constraint is exactly the incentive compatibility constraint and the mu t is as this. It is the excess marginal value of assets over deposits. Mu t uh, it's, it's mu t. Nu t is the marginal cost of deposits and omega t plus one is the additional uh, uh, multiple to discount factor, which is the weighted average of the marginal values of the net worth for exiting and continuing banker at t plus one. Yeah, for exiting banker, it's just one because it just he or she just consumes the net worth, and if it continues, it's exactly this uh, term. <clears throat> So let's talk about the, the result of the banker's uh, problem. So uh, the incentive compatibility constraint is going to be binding as far as uh, the excess marginal value of assets over deposits is going to be positive, but less than uh, the marginal gain from diverting funds, which is theta. Yeah, like it's quite intuitive, I believe, because if mu would be higher than theta, there will be no reason to divert funds and no no role for the incentive uh, constraint at all. So if incentive, if, if we assume that, as paper does, the incentive constraint is going to be binding and will, and from this expression, we receive this equation, which is which gives us basically the endogenous capital constraint on bank portfolio, which limits the uh, the bank's possibility for raising uh, deposits and for uh, for acquiring assets. So the intuitive role of the binding incentive constraint in this setting is, as I said, that it uh, limits the bank's portfolio in such a way that for each uh, given net worth, yeah, I mean net worth this net worth uh, obtained by the from the next period decisions for each given nt the amount of assets that the bank will be able to acquire is limited by this uh, by this uh, constraint on leverage multiple therefore the variation in net worth can translate into variation in bank lending which is, gives rise for the standard financial acceler accelerator mechanism. Uh, and uh, yes, as, uh, again, as I said, the bank uh, uh, run uh, might be, therefore might be possible uh, uh, and banks can, banks can operate with negative MT. Yeah, I'm missing something here. I thought, wouldn't the deposit rate respond endogenously to how severe this uh, ISO constraint is? The RD. Uh, you mean the deposit rate? Uh, yes, of course. Of course. So, how come it all disappeared from this uh, basic constraint? What disappeared? The RD. So, it's all okay. It doesn't. Okay, it shows up from the mu. So, all this uh, discussion yes. is a uh, heuristic. It's the given mu. Suppose mu is less than theta, and then, yeah, the solution to this maximization problem is the corner solution. Mm -hmm. Yes. But eventually, the equilibrium would determine how high the mu is. Uh, 
Yeah, because deposit. Yeah, sure. Is yeah, sure. Okay. Therefore, I refer I refer to this constraint as endogenous constraints. It's going to vary with uh, yeah. with like macroeconomic conditions. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let me skip this slide of about aggregation. Actually, nothing special here. Quite straightforward. Yeah, the one thing to recall is that uh, how the economy is cleared. Yeah, the aggregate output comes from the uh, from the one from the productivity of the capital, the endowments of bankers and households, and it's going to be spent on uh, manage, managerial costs from households, yeah, and consumption of bankers and households. And uh, when we will uh, switch to numerical simulations, the output that will, uh, the impulse response for the output that will appear there are gonna be the output net of managerial costs. So it will present just the consumption. Just remember, keep it in mind. Uh, yeah, let's discuss uh, the condition for the bank equilibrium, yeah. Uh, Let's uh, define the QT star as the liquidation price of the bank's capital in case of the bank run. QT star is gonna be also endogenous. Uh, I will show the slide how it is, uh, how it is defined or derived, uh, I have to say, in uh, this paper. But the key thing is when the bank is insolvent, basically, when, uh, the liquidation value of its assets is less than the deposit obligations. And if it happens, then the bank equilibrium, the bank run equilibrium is possible. So let's define this. Uh, and this is basically the recovery rate XT that we've seen in the household deposit contract. If it is less than one, this is the necessary condition for the bank run. As long as this condition is satisfied, the bank run equilibrium is possible. So the bank run can, can, can uh, occur ex post as far as uh, the bank run, bank run are anticipated. Uh, using the expression for NW constraint, yes, this, uh, this one, we can. Uh, we can uh, restate this condition in, 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 uh, in form of that depend on two key variables, the one of which is the return on bank assets conditional on the bank run RTB star and the phi T uh, minus one, it is the leverage multiple. And uh, this uh, relation FT minus one by FT minus one minus one is basically the, the uh, the ratio of the bank's assets to its uh, deposit obligations. So again, the necessary condition is uh, that xt is less than one. And note that this expression is decreasing function in phi. So uh, the higher leverage multiple uh, leads to lower xt and therefore increases the possibility of the bank run equilibrium. Here is the quick uh, illustration of that. The blue line is uh, represents this relationship when it equals to unity, and the mechanism of how the economy how the economy works is that suppose that initially we're in the no run equilibrium where uh, no bank run equilibrium where x c is uh, equal to unity or or bigger than bigger than unity, then the negative z shock happens. It increases leverage. It reduces liquidation price. Therefore, the RB star lowers, uh, leverage increases, and this brings the economy to B, to the area where the run equilibrium is possible. What, is, do they, what do they mean by bank run equilibrium? They don't suggest that there is a multiple equilibrium, do they? Uh, well, by the bank equilibrium. But yeah, yeah, but by. Uh, uh, no, the, the equilibrium actually is not unique. It's either no run bank equilibrium or bank run equilibrium. By bank run equilibrium, we, we mean uh, when the bank runs, bank runs occur and the banks sell all their capital stock to households by liquidation price QT star. And uh, yeah, and the households gonna, gonna have the whole capital stock on their hands, which also gonna increase the 
credit uh, uh, the credit costs because of the managerial costs by the capital of the capital, capital managerial costs. So here is what roughly uh, is the uh, bank run happens to try, when the bank run occurs. To, what I try to clarify is that uh, given any set of parameter values, the equilibrium here is unique. Is it? Uh, uh, given uh, you, you well, fix fix well, the parameter. Uh, I, I, uh, well, um, would it be the answer to your question if I will say that, as the paper saying, uh, what the paper saying is that the bank run equilibrium here is the sunspot equilibrium. Yeah, but like, still, that may be the unique equilibrium. It's just that the, the bank run occurs. Uh, in certain events, but yes. it was a unique equilibrium. It's just like, well, you flip a coin up, heads up, you have one outcome, heads down, it's another outcome. But there's a unique, uh, in terms of uh, the probability distribution, that's unique. Yeah. Yeah, I think so in that sense, yeah. there's no multiple equilibrium. In contrast to many models where you get actually a multiple equilibrium for the same set of parameter values. Yeah, yeah I yeah. don't think there's a multiple equilibrium. Of course, uh, when you vary the parameter values, you can go above the one, so you get no wrong, and then you get below one, there is a, you know, certain events that the wrong would occur. But yeah, in I that think, case, you get a unique outcome. Yeah, I think, yeah, like uh, Arthur said, that the, the model is calibrated in such a way as to ensure the, the the unique equilibrium, as, as you said. Yeah, I think for, for calibration, for perfect calibration, it is true. Yeah, I think it's not going to be yeah, difficult to prove though. I mean, on the bank side, everything is linear. On the household side, you get a log utility. So your consumption function is also linear uh, in terms of uh, net wealth. So, yeah, yeah. okay. Oh. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I have another question. Uh, is it correct to understand XD as a dynamic cutoff in the, in the model, in the sense that uh, XD can give us like a, a sense about the output of the model? Yeah, of course it is, it's not static because it varies with time depending on the leverage and the uh, liquidation return on bank assets, of course. It's uh, varies with leverage, with phi, and with QT star, which, as I said in the very beginning, are two key variables that are going to uh, uh, determine whether XT is minus, is uh, less than one, and therefore whether the bank run equilibrium is possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, like here, uh, let me be very quick here. Here's uh, how the QT star can be derived. The key thing here, it, it comes from the household oil recreation. The key thing here is to notice that it is proportional to Z, to productivity shock. So if uh, the economy faces negative productivity shock, then the QT star goes down and therefore XT uh, also goes down and it can be less than unity, which makes the bank run equilibrium possible. Uh, here's the calibration of the baseline model. Uh, some parameters are quite standard, some of them are not. So they calibrate sigma, the banking survival probability, as such that the expected lifetime of each bank is roughly five years. One period here is one quarter, very, very standard. The theta is calibrated, theta and uh, WB, the banker's endowment is calibrated such that the phi, the steady state leverage multiple is 10, which corresponds roughly to like the, the leverage ratio of the shadow banks uh, prior to the Great Recession and such that the credit spread is uh, 100 basis points. Steady state productivity Z is uh, Calibrated such that the Q is equal to one. Yeah, exactly the case that Professor mentioned about. Uh, yeah, and the household endowment is calibrated such, such that uh, uh, the aggregate household endowment down to three times the steady state C. So, yeah. what's the target for pinning down alpha? 
There seems to be a critical value. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's our, it's uh, more or less arbitrary. Arbitrary. Just uh, authors saying that uh, this alpha is doesn't have uh, some target. They're just calibrated. Is that it's you know for some medium level of convexity, something like that. To that's, ensure that they to ensure that. Unfortunate. <laughs> yes. Maybe how important uh, it is. Yes, uh, I agree. But yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> in this paper, it's just some arbitrary value to ensure that the, the that the marginal cost of holding capital not so high, but at, at the same time they exist. So it's it's arbitrary. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so so I thought I thought that the target they use for capturing theta should be used for calibrating alpha. And for theta, they can, for example, use the, the ratio of the banking sector to GDP, for example. Uh, well, maybe, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, probably. <laughs> like, uh, but yeah, the paper doesn't say a lot about alpha. Alpha. When you think about it, theta really captures how important the banking is. So naturally, I would think you just use the size of the banking sector to the economy as a target. For alpha, well, that determines how much, uh, you know, the household would do direct investment versus depositing. That I would, I would uh, just, you know, use the, top, the spread that they used, the 100 basis point. Or if you don't use the banking sector, at least take the ratio of deposit mm -hmm. to GDP. That's basically similar to the to the importance of the banking sector. That can be used as a target. I wonder why they don't use that. Sorry, sorry, Vlad. One one yep. quick question. When we did all this, I mean, they are. I think you mentioned it. There is no expectations of the households about X or, or in the first order condition, like we can arrange to get X somewhere in an expectation. Uh, there is so no expectation it, about the bank run. Okay, okay, that's, that's what I wanted that's to okay. know. So, yeah, the bank run in the model that I talked so far can occur only X post, not X ante. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, here's the uh, uh, impulse response for uh, for the case when there is no run equilibrium. I mean that uh, the case when uh, no run occurs. So basically, this uh, negative five percent Z shock produces a, around six percent uh, recession in the output net of uh, managerial costs. So the mechanism is quite straightforward. Ne uh, negative Z-shock arouses the bank's capital, which because of the uh, leverage constraint uh, arouses uh, uh, bank's capital holding. This, this also in turn depresses capital prices, increases uh, credit spread. Uh, so this is just the illustration of the basic uh, financial accelerator uh, mechanism. So it's quite general. Uh, here's what happens if we will allow for the bank run equilibrium in the second quarter uh, or in the second period after the shock. Uh, here it is assumed that the uh, un unanticipated run occurs. Yeah, so here the variable run is 1 minus 60. So as far as run, this line is positive. The bank run equilibrium is possible. If it is negative, uh, there's no possibility for the bank run. And again, the negative Z shock uh, depresses net worth. It depresses. It also depresses Q star, the uh, recovery uh, asset price, uh, which uh, in, gives rise for the banking run equilibrium. And as far as it happens, the you know, the, ca the bank's capital stock basically goes to zero, and all the uh, capital stock uh, goes to. Uh, goes to households, and again, the credit spread rises even sig more significant in comparison with the no no run uh, recession. And yeah, I think it's more severe than in the no run case. Uh, let me talk briefly about what is the how the model is extended in order to allow for anticipated bank run or ex ante run. Let's define a PT as the probability that the household assigns 
at period t for a bank run happening in t plus one. Of course, this will change the household's uh, first uh, optimal decision on the deposits and change the oil evacuation. Uh, and uh, the key thing here to uh, uh, understand is that as far as PT is not zero, the promised rate of return on deposits, RT plus one bar, is not going to be more uh, risk-free rate. It's going to be risky, yes, exactly because of the possibility of the bank run and uh, uh, subsequent bad, uh, bad things. Uh, yeah, uh, therefore, like the, it's also gonna affect the XT plus one, the recovery rate uh, ratio, and therefore possibility of the bank run itself. And under some uh, assumption, uh, the promised rate of return on deposits gonna be the increasing function of the probability of the bank run. And the intuition is also quite, I think, straightforward as far as the probability of a bank run is uh, higher the risk is higher and therefore a uh, bank must compensate uh, its depositors when run is more likely. So here is, it's the meaningful assumption. Uh, uh, yeah, also to save some time, I'll let me not speak in detail about the equations uh, here on the slide. Um, uh, the key thing here is that the probability of the bank run PT also going to affect the leverage multiple through the uh, excess uh, marginal return on bank's assets, mu t, because after pt is introduced and after some modification, uh, mu t is going to be a uh, decreasing function of pt, which makes um, the pi t, the leverage ratio, also the decreasing function. And therefore, when probability of the bank run increases, the leverage constraint gonna to, will tighten, therefore uh, making the financial financial wealth yeah, of the banks uh, much worse. Uh, yeah, the punchline of uh, the model uh, uh, with the uh, p with anticipated bank runs is that the increased probability of the bank run gonna erode the bank's capital uh, through two ways: the one through the increased cost of deposits, cost, uh, cost of debt, and the secondly through tightening the leverage constraint, phi t. So therefore, when PT rises, the bank credit basically constructs and the economy suffers. Uh, authors make very uh, simple assumption on how the PT is formed. It's they're saying that, okay, let's just link the PT to the expectation of the xc plus one of the recovery rate next period and make it a uh, decreasing function of the expectation of the xt plus one. So, so if, uh, how, yes. how to read the last bullet point, the PT being higher, the, then it implies the economy suffers more. That's when the bank run occurs. Uh, yes, the economy suffers relative to itself. But if we think about the last bullet point as a cross-country comparison, it doesn't necessarily mean that a banking crisis would be more damaging in a country with a higher P. Because the banking sector is also smaller. If P is yeah, okay. higher, people mm -hmm. don't put so much money in the bank. Yes, it did, but uh, as uh, it will become clear in a moment, higher P leads, as I said, to the con to the tightening leverage constraint and uh, even the endogenously, of course, the banking sector becomes uh, relative to the overall economy, the erosion of the capital produces the same financial accelerator mechanism and even uh, with no bank run, increase in PT also provokes, uh, increase in PT as the consequence of the negative productivity shock gives rise for the recession, for the mild economic yeah, so recession. The, multi the multiplier is larger, but you know, the effect is the multiplier times the size of the banking sector, but the base you're multiplying is also smaller. So it's not a Canadian product, it's, it's bigger. Now, the financial accelerator is stronger. That's a multiplier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so I'm just thinking whether that's actually true empirically. If you compare, let's say, the US with whatever country you have in mind, where the financial constraint is tighter because the banks are, I mean, there are more crooks in the banks. They take well, them uh, in the wrong way. Well, uh, I think, remember that here the banking model is the model of the shadow banks. I think in the economies where the banks, uh, when the share of share of the standard commercial banks insured by the deposits, but when deposit, deposit where deposits are insured, uh, in such economies, like uh, maybe the effect will be, of course, an absolute value less than the in economies where the for like the uh, for the majority of the financial system is unregulated. Maybe, yeah. I, th I think it, it might be the case. I agree. Yeah, I mean, even when we take shadow banks into account, those shadow banks are not necessarily, you know, illegal. Yeah, I mean, most shadow mm -hmm. banks in the US, they're completely illegal business. It's just we use the word shadow to describe precisely what you said. They're not under the regulation of, let's say, deposit requirement, sorry, the reserve requirement and all these legal constraints. But they're perfectly like, you know, operating to intermediate between funds and the yep. investments. So cross-country yep. comparison is really what this master bonita is trying to suggest, but it's, uh, I would say it just means that the financial multiplier is stronger. That's all. Basically, yeah, that's, I, I didn't try to, to capture this uh, a cross country comparison writing this uh, bullet point. I just wanted to point out, yeah, just this financial accelerator thing, basically, that's it. So l let's quickly look at the IRFs. Uh, uh, so again, this is uh, the uh, response to the negative Z shock uh, when uh, the, uh, again, when there is no uh, bank run exposed. So here we just see that the negative uh, Z-shock increases the probability of the bank run to around 2%. This in turn uh, provokes the standard like erosion of the bank capital and all the uh, things that we talked about uh, during the, when we considered the baseline model are still in true, but yes, the, uh, the magnitude of the shock is, uh, is larger. Uh, yeah, so here, again, just standard financial accelerator thing, uh, which is more crucial for the, like for this paper and for uh, in comparison with the uh, empirical data is let's see the case when the bank run, the exposed bank run happens in the fourth period after the Z-shock. So here is, we see the, uh, first of all, instant increase in the probability of the bank run, which goes basically to zero in the period of the bank run because no banks left uh, in this period. Uh, again, the recession first, initially it is quite mild, but in the, on the edge of the crisis, it, the decrease in the GDP is equals around minus 10% relative to its steady state. Uh, bank uh, capital holdings again goes to zero in case of the bank run uh, and uh, yeah the asset prices drop sharply uh, on the edge of the crisis and uh, yeah we see the instant rise in the credit spreads and instant erosion of the bank capital to the levels minus around 15 percent relative to its uh, GDP and uh, let's take these IRFs and let's compare what the model suggests in this okay, case. So how do we read these graphs? Did the shock occur at time zero? Yeah, the shock occurred at time zero and uh, the bank run happens in uh, fourth period after the shock. Is that why you got this non-monotonicity? That seems yes. why you, you have some kind of uptick initially from zero to one, from period zero to one. Yeah, like the the uh, what happens between period zero and four? It is like uh, what happens. Uh, what, what's happening 
like just moments before the, the collapse of the financial system, before the bank run. Then in the fourth period, the bank run happens and uh, like all the, all the capital holdings, banks capital holding, all the banks assets are sold to households and we see in this, this basically collapse of the financial system. So, so Vlad, just uh, to clarify something, all those graphs that goes to zero and then recovers, when it goes to zero, it means that all banks are wiped out and then the new banks start in the new period, some with capital and the capital recover. Yes, right? exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So let's, again, as I said, let's take uh, this, like the impulse response and bring it to the data, to what, compare it to the data, to the thing that actually happened during the uh, Great Recession. And as you can see, the model, the theoretical insights uh, fits quite well what happened in the, uh, on the edge, during the edge of the global financial crisis. Here is just two graphs. One shows the credit spreads, and the second is the bank equity. Bank equity is basically the VT in our model. Uh, and the, uh, the data line is measured by the S&P financial uh, aggregate index. And we see that the model captures the pattern uh, quite well, uh, fairly well. Yes, the only discrepancy is that the credit spreads just right after the crisis are much lower compared to what the model suggests, but it reflects the, the policy interventions made by the Fed. So here are main takeaways uh, from, uh, from the paper. So yeah, first of all, the recession constraints bank lending because of the leverage constraint and therefore due to conventional financial accelerator, this opens up the possibility of the bank run because of the weakening of the balance sheets and the reduced liquidity in the asset markets, namely the lower asset prices. And the bank anticipated bank runs, as we've seen, as we've seen here, yeah, they might be costly even if uh, runs do not occur actually exposed. And uh, yeah, this uh, this period of anticipation, this, this four periods just right after, right before the bank run, it captures well what happened really during the Great Recession. So what? Uh, are the policy, main policy implications of uh, that model and, of, and that mechanism that we, that we saw. Uh, when we're talking about the uh, banking okay, distress. So, yeah. go, please go back. Wouldn't the second opinion be even stronger? Anticipated ones can be even more harmful than anticipated ones. If the household anticipates yes, 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 around, they're going to take stuff really out of the bank. But if yes. they're unanticipated, well, the bank have already took stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. So, here is, these IRFs exactly illustrate this thing because like here we, these IRFs compare the recession with, positive, with anticipated bank run with the recession with no anticipation of the bank run. And we see that indeed the anticipated uh, uh, the recession associated with the anticipated bank run is more harmful. Right. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So let, let me briefly talk uh, about the policy implications. So, yeah, uh, again, the uh, first thing that, we are, that comes to our mind when we think about the banking crisis and banking stress is the deposit insurance. But in this particular framework, it's a bad idea because once the deposits are insured in these banks, in this model, in the shadow banks, the incentive for financial friction just implies that the bank will simply increase their leverage and divert funds. So based deposit insurance doesn't give us a lot of good things. What is really uh, important here is the capital requirements. Uh, again, as we've seen, the once uh, the banks uh, make their decisions about their 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 leverage, uh, they do not take into account these uh, bad consequences for the overall economy because of their decisions. Uh, so therefore, the we can set the maximum level of for phi t for leverage multiple below let's say fair value 
which in turn will increase the recovery rate XT and therefore reduce the probability of the bank drop. Uh, keeping all the things, all things, uh, all else equal. Yeah. The downside of this uh, suggestion is that, as Professor also mentioned, this reduced bank uh, intermediation and therefore uh, provokes higher overall cost of, of, of capital. And moreover, uh, as phi t, as the leverage multiple varies with, it's not static variable, it's varies with uh, economic conditions the optimum level of phi t is also probably going to be uh, static. Uh, for, ex and for example, with that respect, such regulations as Basel III or Dodd-Frank Act, they imply the contracyclical capital buffers. And so, yeah, we can probably the optimal phi t is uh, going to be contracyclical, but still it's, uh, it, it needs uh, to be studied. Uh, what about exposed policies? Exposed policies all uh, are dealing with the central bank's abilities to lend, to, uh, to act as a lender of last reserve. Uh, uh, so again, because uh, the banks are financially constrained uh, in, this, in this economy, there is a room for credit interventions by the central banks. And uh, we could, can suggest the direct, per, direct asset purchases or land or land, direct lending to the banks in order to support asset prices and reduce credit sp spreads. And in fact, this is exactly what the Fed did during uh, the, the uh, economic meltdown of uh, last decade. It implemented QE programs, it created some facilities. For example, PDCF, the primary, primary dealer credit facility, allowed Fed to lend directly to the investment banks, which was not allowed before the crisis. And moreover, these tools, uh, once everybody knows that they are in place, uh, these tools can have positive ex ante uh, effect. I mean, meaning as, uh, uh, as in case of the famous Paulson's bazooka, uh, once everybody knows that these tools are available for the policymakers that can reduce the probability of the of runs ex ante. But the downside of uh, such uh, ex ante effect is the moral hazard problem, yeah. Like, uh, does everybody uh, know about this, like Paulson's bazooka quote? No. I thought of a shotgun, not a bazooka. What? A shotgun, like a gun that shoots. I think it was bazooka. <laughs> okay, like, it's it, evil it, voice. It, it, yeah, the, the narrative was that during the summer of 2008, when the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, basically two government-sponsored government agents, uh, agencies that backed the mortgage market, the whole mortgage market of the US, they were under very pretty big stress uh, during the summer 2008 and were just moments away from the bankruptcy. And uh, because they played such a big role to the financial system and to the mortgages, uh, the government uh, suggested uh, uh, to uh, pass the law that will allow government to put these agencies under conservatorship, basically bail out them. And uh, the Treasury Secretary, Henry Paulson, when uh, he urged uh, congressmen to pass that law during the congressional hearings in July, probably, I believe in July of 2008, he used this, uh, this example of the bazooka uh, to motivate uh, passing that law, saying basically that once you have bazooka in your pocket and everybody knows it, uh, you're probably not gonna use it actually. But uh, unfortunately, it turned out that uh, by the early September, both Freddie and Fanny were put, they were bailed out by the government. So <laughs> this policy didn't uh, work much uh, well, just during the uh, Great Recession. Yeah. Just speaking in terms of the model, I think the most effective policy here is bank supervision. It's better than any of the policies listed here. That's, uh, that's actually one of the open questions that I wanted to mention just on the next slide is like, what is the optimal policy? And moreover, what is the policy mix between ex ante and ex post policies? Which of them are more effective? Uh, that's what we can think uh, about after reading this paper. And uh, 
moreover, like I think it would be interesting to also to think about how actually the beliefs of the likelihood of the bank run are formed, because here in, in this paper, uh, authors assumed very, very uh, simple linear link between the probability of the bank run and the economic fundamentals, uh, but uh, maybe the beliefs are more complex. So it's also another uh, thing for further research. And of course, if uh, as this paper, is, if we aim to describe the financial crisis in all the details, we need probably a richer financial system, uh, not only shadow banks, but also standard banks, uh, other intermediaries. intermediaries so uh, yeah, we can think about a lot of things uh, after reading this paper. So yeah, that's yeah. what I what, they, what I, go, I wanted go, to, go to, back, to say. Go back, go back. The other, yeah, the the question, the open question is that not this one. Yeah, these are good questions. But for the second question, I forgot whether I listed the paper by Morris and Shin. That model would answer this question. So, which, like, wait, wait, wait. so sorry, Marcus. Which model, Professor? Uh, Morris and Shin. Mm -hmm. Do you have it in your syllabus? I think so. In the past years, I did, but I'm not sure this year I, did, I put on it. Well, okay. Thank you. Well, I mean, the Morris and Shin uh, model was designed to answer about currency crisis. Um, but it's the same thing that you can apply to bank runs. How beliefs are formed. Marcus, did you want to ask something? Yes, so in the previous slide from this one, coming back from the discussion we had uh, minutes ago. So the, the thing here with the second bullet with interventions from the, the government, is that thinking in this model, you have to assume that these, these, these guys have a better function F, right? So they are better holding capital or something like that um, than households. Yeah. But in, in, in countries where, for example, you have um, high theta, that, that I mean banks are big crooks. It's usually the case, I'm thinking, for example, in my country, that the government are worse crooks, so that the function F is even worse than the, the, how can it be, than the households. I mean, if bank intervenes, it's for worse, no, not for better. Um, so yeah, I mean, but, but that's the, the, the point in the second one, right? You have to assume that the function F from the, from the, from the government or the, 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 the one that is intervening is better than those from the households. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. The, the government has a theta equal to one in this exam, in the example you have in mind. Exactly, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I just agree that it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Of course, yeah, policy you, implications you for different countries you, might be different. Yeah, you rely on a government. You rely on a government, hoping that they're going to do something good. Well, they took all your money away. Exactly. Unfortunately, so, uh, unfortunately some countries suffer. At times, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So that's the end of this course. Or, or you still have to hand in your written report and the final exam. So, but for now, that's, that's all. And then thank all of you for participating. And I hope the second half of this course will be even better. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Professor. Thank you, Professor.